There we go. That ought to do it. Let's see. I love the fix. There's the fix. Woo. <laughs> All right, there we go. It helps when you uh, hit a button. There's about 100 of them on this console here beside me, and you got to hit the right one. Hey, everyone, I'm going to try this again. It's Odie Coyote here on Mixed Catcher 106 of the Bar Talk Happy Hour. As you just kind of heard a little bit, we have Thomas Michael Riley, and those who are listening and obviously couldn't hear me a second ago, what I was saying is our server is down, and we're just having technical issues, and I just love it. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but it's still a good night, as promised, and we're still starting pretty much on time, which is always a good thing. Uh, Thomas Michael Riley, I'll just let him, he's on the phone with us, so we won't be able to see him, but we can definitely hear him, and I think that's about as much as we could ask for tonight, honestly, but uh, Thomas, how you doing? Good, and I, I look better on the phone, so this is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't live great? I mean, it's real. Uh, it, it, it's life. So, we, you know, it's it, it's coming at us. <laughs> right now is the equivalent of if I were doing a show and the main PA system just cut out. That, that's about sure. the level of, of where we're at right now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I, so I'm it's sure. not life and death. It's not like we're trying to land the space shuttle. This is wonderful. <laughs> oh. And that didn't always go right, unfortunately, but you know. No, it did not. <laughs> uh, but I also have in the studio, and I, and I, I don't want to neglect her because she's amazing. Producer Raven, how you doing? Doing good. And I realized that your camera froze now on, on here as well. Do you see that? <laughs> we'll fix that. Because the camera <laughs> shot that's on there right now actually just has it where it's uh, with her not there. But we'll fix that here. That's okay. I don't like being on camera. <laughs> well, we're going to fix that. Oh. Yeah, Raven, you sound great. That's the important thing. She does. <laughs> Until we get Isn't to our she, camera. <laughs> Isn't she amazing? <laughs> yes. Yep, and good attitude. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So we're going to fix this uh, whole thing here. And I, hope, for, I th hope you guys will forgive us because this type of thing, just it, it just happens. So there's sure. nothing anybody can do about it. You just have to roll with the punches. And uh, there she is. I told you guys I could fix it. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, Thomas, let's dive into it. This whole thing is about you. Uh, we had such a great conversation. I feel bad that our audience isn't going to get to hear the, the, the interview on the radio side. But at the same time, we're going to pretty much be talking about the same things. And we're also going to go over uh, all the new stuff that we normally would. The difference with us is we're not doing the show and the live stream live like we usually would. Because this show is now syndicated, meaning other stations will air this, that version has already been recorded and sent out. Now, we are not able to air that right now at our normal time because of the server issues, but we will get it up, and I will get it on the air tonight so you guys can hear it uh, and hear the show. So we will get that fixed. All right. Well, Thomas, I guess we'll start over because nobody's heard the interview yet, so we don't know anything about you. Let's start from there. <laughs> Tell us about yourself. Uh, make sure you include your Social Security number. I mean, we, no. all, we all need to do that We don't days. do that. We don't? No. Oh. Okay. Well... Uh, tell us about yourself, where you're from, how long you've been doing country music, and uh, get all the, the details out so we get a basic understanding of who you are and what makes you great. That's well, thanks cheesy. so much. Uh, 20, yeah, 20 years now, full-time uh, music. I quit my day job. I, had a, uh, I crammed four years of college into six and a half years, and I finally got a degree in English. And that let me teach uh, high school English in Liberty Hill, Texas. So I did that for a couple of years while I was writing songs. And then... Uh, some of the good uh, folks that you may know, some of my heroes and legends now, like Gary P. Nunn, picked up my songs, and, and uh, he finally put three of them on his Greatest Hits album And uh, after he had picked up eight songs. And then he said, Riley, you need to be the one out there singing your songs because, one, you have a good voice and you're a good entertainer, but, two, they're good songs and they're yours. He said, so don't give them to anybody else. He said, because that's why you can get on stage with, Willie Nelson or Merle Haggard, anybody in the world, because they're your stories and they're unique to you. And he said, but I would like to have one more song, that Johnson City to Blanco. And, I, and of course, I told him, no, he couldn't have that one because a good friend of mine told me not to give those songs away, but to go sing them myself. <laughs> so that's how I got started 20 years ago. <laughs> and, and just doing a little bit of the digging here, 300 songs in your career. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have voices in my head, and, and sometimes I write them down. <laughs> is there after all this if somebody let's say shouted out a song that you did like five or six years ago or, or worse like let's say 10 years ago could you sing it 
It, it, do you feel like you I could, could sing, go through every one of those 300 songs? I could do every word, every song. It's just because all you have to remember is one word. They're like dominoes. And so if, if you get the first domino to fall, the rest of them are done. And it's even worse than that. So I, I can go through all of my songs, and I know a, a thousand cover tunes that I love. So I have the same curse in my head at all times. I can hit one word of those songs, and I know every word of those songs. So it's a, yeah, it, it's, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse. So sometimes uh, you have to make the voices go away. <laughs> That's why I listen to radio. <laughs> well, there you go. And, and, and there's so much stuff. Do you ever feel like after 300, like the, the creativity is just not there? How, how bad does the writer's block get for you these days? It doesn't get bad. Uh, here, I found just the opposite. Uh, now I run from them. Uh, one, I don't ever want to do the same thing I've already done. So it has to be an idea that you know makes my head kind of cock. And then, you know, then here comes you know the do I call it the you know, the uh, the taco plate combo because here comes the words with music attached, and you get something stuck in your head, and that's when I start running. And if I can't run away from it, in other words, if it keeps circling back and haunting me. Then I'll write it down, and then I go, okay, here we go, and this this is kind of cool, and then you get into it, and some of them are over very quickly, and some of them, you know, they linger and they won't go away, and then you then you have to you have to finish them, uh, like a third verse to a song that that took you, you know, two thirds of the way across the ocean, and now what are you going to do? Stop and drown, or or figure out? Okay, we're supposed to get across this ocean. So that's what's happening now. And it probably has been for the last, oh, three albums. <laughs> Isn't that great? And then you get a lot higher call rate, you know, because you, you're a little more particular about what, what's going to haunt you the rest of your life. So you've got to, you got to make sure it's gooder than, than the last one was. So the bar keeps going up. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that oh, the truth? God. Yeah. <laughs> more than you wanted to know, but that's, that's me. <laughs> oh man! Well, I tell you, it's just great, and uh, and and if I'm, I'm going to mention this too, if anybody's watching on any of the streams, we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook. Just look us up, Mix Country 106. Uh, you're, if you're well, you're already watching. I'm so used to doing this as the syndicate. This is my habit. See, so, you know, you're talking about that first word and the domino. My thought was, yep. oh, I got people listening on the radio because I'm not used to just doing a live stream. I'm used to being on air and doing the live stream and then splitting them up. So I'm here telling people, of course, they're watching. But tell your friends to watch. <laughs> and then also, if you have any questions for Thomas Michael Riley, put them in the comments below. And uh, Thomas, I don't know, did you get a chance to share this on your page uh, earlier on? I don't know. But I, I'm, I have someone that does that, so I don't know the answer. But I can go to my page and tell you. <laughs> well, if you're listening over there, we appreciate it as well. Um, I know I, I, I sent the link uh, to the blog to your promoter, so uh, we'll see if she uh, right. did that. Um, I did my best to try. We had this plan. This, I wouldn't call it last minute. We, we planned this on, on no. Thursday. Um, or actually, it would have been what was it, Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday when we had the call. And uh, so this isn't exactly last minute. I mean, I had time to get the posters and all that done. So sure. it's all good. Um, all right, yeah. so, you know, I used, I, I sang a little bit when I was younger. I, I would say semi-professionally, um, uh, and, I, and I didn't necessarily want to take the easy way out, but I'll tell you something real quick uh, about me, and a lot of people know this, but I'm actually legally blind. Um, I, uh, I can't see hardly at all out of my left eye, and my right eye is about 20 over 200, which perspective, what you see at 200 feet away, I have to be 20 feet away to see the same thing. Wow. And... Uh, so that's obviously why I do radio, because if I tried to do TV, I wouldn't be able to read a prompter to save my life. Um, <laughs> but what, 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 was it, what was hard is, you know, my, my mother was always really supportive of me going out and singing and uh, doing all that. And as a kid, I could listen to the radio for like six hours at a time. And, and you're talking about a seven and eight year old having the attention span to be able to sit in one place and just listen to the radio. Um, sure. <laughs> And, uh, and I went out and I, I sang at some bars and all of that. And quickly as my eyesight deteriorated, my then fiance, now wife Raven, you know, it was just getting hard to try to go to all these bars and I would do these karaoke contests and all that. And the highlight of that is we decided back in 2012, I was going to try to do this thing and see what I could do. I, w I wanted to do the TV show, The Voice. And I, I did 
I did better than a lot of people. I was in an arena and down in St. Louis with multiple people. And I am getting to a point here, I promise. Uh, but I, I went to this arena and, and I realized it was because I, was, I had a story. It was because I, I had the vision. And at that time, I used a service dog. Uh, and of course it was so attractive and all the news media, you know, were, were interviewing me that day. And I went through all the different rounds that you had to do talking to all the producers. And at the very end of the day, I was an alternate, meaning if one of the, the cast members who they did select got sick or couldn't do it, uh, they would call me and I would be on the next flight out to LA. And, um, nice. so I know I'm not terrible. But at the same time, what's hard about music, and at least in my position, was traveling. I, I, I couldn't travel, and I didn't want to be known or get notoriety because of my disability. I wanted to get notoriety because of my talent and, and you know, God-given gift. And, uh, and that just didn't seem possible. So uh, I, I'd always loved radio. My, my degree is in broadcasting, and so I went down this path, and this path has allowed me to be, I think, more genuine and not let my outward appearance, I guess, if you will, uh, sway how people perceive me. Because in radio, as you said, you look prettier on the radio. Well, when I'm doing radio, you have no idea. And I just sound like every other, you know, DJ and um, all that. But I guess what I was going to ask you and alluding to, have you had any similar struggle? Not, not, necessarily, not necessarily eyesight, but like struggles with like, you know, just trying to get transportation, trying to get a bus, get a van, get the gear in and... <laughs> You know, horror stories about how people kind of took you and, and all of that. What, what, what are some of the stories that you can share uh, for the struggles you've been through in your career? I will start with my favorite story. Uh, my very first festival, a music festival, was 17 years ago when Lukenbach, Texas, said, Riley, we'd, we'd like you to do a music festival here. <laughs> We've had, we had one big one. That was Willie Nelson. We have several now, but we want you to have it. Uh, and so my headliner Friday night was Billy Joe Shaver, and Saturday night was Gary P. Nunn. And now Billy Joe Shaver, you know, music starts at noon. Now I'm, I'm ready for Billy Joe about 9 o'clock. 8 o'clock, he's not there. 8.30, he's not there. Quarter to 9, he pulls up in the van. And he says, here's the deal, Riley. Our van wouldn't run. It was overheating. And we were, we were coming from Waco, Texas, which is, you know, about three hours. And he said... I told the guys, uh, show me what's wrong. We got out and lifted, the, lifted up the hood, and, and he said, it's the radiator. It's overheating right here. He said, I put my hands on the radiator to pray. I didn't leave them there very long. <laughs> I told him, all right, close the hood. Let's get back in the, in the van and get the looking box. This kid needs us. And we got in the van and drove straight there. And in 15 minutes, he was on stage in time to start the show. And that's when I believe. I mean, I always believed in a higher power. But I didn't see it work until my very first festival. And I swear, not only was it so uplifting, you know that feeling that you get where you know the word is uplifting, but it actually makes you feel lighter and you vibrate at a different level. And, and the music from Billy Joe Shaver that night lifted us all up off of the ground. Mm. It was just an unbelievable moment. So that's, that's just one story. But yeah, there's transportation problems almost every month. <laughs> Especially in Europe, when you're when you're counting on trains and buses and, and airplanes. So <laughs> I was gonna say you probably have a, a flight kit that you take with you, and then everything else you're just relying on the venue and wherever you're at to to make sure that's all working right. Exactly. Yep. Is, yeah, is, and then there's a little language barrier, and so it's it depending on where you're going. So if you go to the Midwest, they they talk very plain and, and very clearly. <laughs> And if you go to uh, strange places, you know, like Oberhof in Switzerland, you have to listen very carefully. <laughs> so you've been all over the world. Is there a stage or a venue that you just sticks out in your mind and, and maybe ranks towards the top of your list of places that you ever wanted to play? Yeah, the uh, I couldn't believe this one. If, if, imagine if you would for a minute. It was in Grindelwald, Switzerland. And it sounds like something out of a, you know, a, you know, the, the the beasts of Grindelwald or something. But it, you're looking at the Eiger Mountains, and then you're and then you're playing in a stage, and it, I mean it's like you're in a a fairyland. The the, uh, the cows they bring them down from the mountains, uh, or or drive them up in the mountain. I can't remember what time of year it is, but they're on the streets, <laughs> and there's people parasailing off mountains and and landing in a park, 
there's cows. Everyone has a different bell that rings a different note, so you know who it is and who's <laughs> missing. And I'm thinking, where, where is it? Am I dreaming, or is this really going on? <laughs> what you might have to elaborate yeah, more it, on that. What was that like for you, just being in that environment? Like, you're like, did, did, were you thinking, I didn't sign up for this? Or were you thinking, I like this in a weird sort of way, but it's very different? Yeah, I thought it was very cool. Very cool. And cool. then, uh, of course, yeah. And, and you know, I have a handicap, too. I'm tall. I'm six foot six. And with a cowboy hat, you know, about six eight. And over there... Not many of them wear cowboy hats and boots. Um, so, so right away, and they love Texans, you know, or or, or that image of Texans. So, uh, so right away, I was a big celebrity, <laughs> even though you couldn't speak the language. The music is universal, so yes. so people would would uh, you know just love, and they listen hard because they know some some English, probably more English, you know, than than a lot of folks, uh, but. Uh, but it was very cool. And, and, uh, <laughs> have you gotten to that point where people know your songs and they just sort of sing along with them? Oh, it's worse than that. Uh, in, uh, in Ponte de France, they had line dances arranged to every one of my songs. <laughs> and I went, I turned to the band cause you know, we're live and, and live, you know, we can go anywhere with a song. I went, Hey guys, <laughs> follow me. We're going to have to remember the way we recorded this because that's the way they, Learn their line dances. <laughs> so, so I'm singing songs like Redneck Riviera or Chicken Choking Blues, and I've got to make sure I'm doing them the way we record it as best as I can remember. <laughs> but yeah, they'll shout out the right words at the right time, and they'll they'll do uh, they'll do. Uh, I've got a song, uh, Ten Toes Up, Ten Toes Down, and, and I I do hand gestures, so it's a it's a sign along instead uh -huh. of a sing along. But if I you use your, your hands like they were your feet, so ten toes up, you raise your hands up and down, put them down. It's, it kind of looks like calisthenics, you know, throughout the song. <laughs> but, but, but one gentleman uh, would only raise one hand, and, and I said, I figured he was drinking it. I said, look, I said, sir, everybody else has got this down. I said, but it's it's not five toes up and five, it's ten toes. And he stood up from his seat. He only had one arm. So <laughs> I felt bad. So now I just tell him, Hey, do give it your all, everything you can. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> oh, Are, God. Do you consider yourself a country music, uh, you know, aficionado kind of like you can just listen to a song and know if it's good or bad. And and I'm talking about uh, any genre of country music. So not just Texas, but you know, red dirt, uh, Americana, even mainstream country. Do you, do you, do you tend to listen to a lot of different variety? I listen to just all music. I, I, I think, there's all, I think all music is good, and some of it just really uh, knocks you down. It's that good. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so there's songs. I call it the, the songs that make me stop on the side of the road and just go, what did I just hear? You know, and, mm. and who was that? And when, we're, when, we're, when we listen to a song, we, you know, when we, when we hear it back, it's, it's like you're birthing a baby. I can't have any babies, but we can birth a song. And then, you know, man, that's an ugly baby. Or, whoa, that's a beautiful baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Raven, this is a question producer Raven wanted me to ask you. I, I don't like to oh, ask ar real artists these type of questions, to be honest. So I, I'm doing this for Raven. I'm, I'm not disowning you, you or this, but I'll, I'll ask. I'll see what, what he thinks about this. He's either going to like this question or he's going to hang out the phone and we're going to have to figure out what to do for the next 40 minutes. What's, what's that click? click <laughs> we'll wing it. Okay. Like we Here, how about you ask the question? This is, this is your question. Yeah, Raven uh -huh. asked. No. Uh-uh. No, so that's not the deal. <laughs> she writes the questions or at least helps write them and then I read them. Cool. All right. Um, what do, have you heard the new song from Beyonce? Uh called texas hold'em i have not i know she's got the new album but i haven't heard any of the cuts off her new album good so we can do a dolly one also on there so i <laughs> have not did. heard the texas hold'em all right so we, <laughs> you've heard of it now i've listened to it and that thing is as far removed from country music as you can get that is my humble opinion <laughs> but i don't know what it is maybe it's the fear of ticking off the queen bee but uh every, a lot of country artists who i thought were like really good like dolly parton for instance have supported this this track 
And I'm thinking this has every bit of the making of pop music if I've ever heard it. And I guess I can take <laughs> that question then and I can tie it into this. What do you think of, let's, let's kind of combine this because you've been all around the world. I think you even told me once that you were out in Nashville for a, a, a short time. Um, yes, I lived there and uh, I'd go in the ride every day. Well, five days a week. There you go. So if you compared the, because Texas country music is its own industry. All right. We, we're going to put that one into its own thing. We fit into that category. Um, but then you have mainstream country music, right? Which is what everybody knows. It's the I hearts of the world and, and how that gets all promoted. What do you think about the country music industry and maybe split it into two? So the country music industry as in mainstream and then country music industry for what we call the Texas country music industry. What do you think about them right now in the current state and, and the way it's progressing? Well, here, here's the problem. When I got into the music business, I got in it because of music. If you say the, when you add the word business to the end of music, all of a sudden uh, my heart kind of sinks. Mm. Because, uh, but the truth is that it, that it is a business, and the, and the Nashville side um, is, is a bigger business. So, uh, and, and I can see, to keep a business alive, why they would go with things like, um, they had an artist named Garth Brooks, when I was younger. Oh, yeah, Garth Chris, Brooks. Chris James, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And they, they sold some product for, for Nashville. <laughs> and they got, uh, I remember one of his, I swear I watched this uh, from TV, but I, I swear it was, he was in Ireland or somewhere. And he had fans singing along. Anyway, at that time, uh, country music business was making so much revenue that they could support a lot more labels on a lot more acts. And so mm -hmm. that was the good thing about the business side of, of, of the big, uh, natural movement in music. And, and is that it, it could support, they could, they could take more risks mm -hmm. with more acts. And so, uh, Texas doesn't have anything organized like that. Texas music, which is where a, a red dirt and, and just independent music, I call it. Sure. If you're not, not signed up, that is just, uh, it's just saying the truth, no matter that it's not politically correct. It's the truth doesn't have to be. It just has to be the truth. Yeah. And then, and then you say that from your perspective, your experiences and, uh, and the truth has a way of, 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 of touching everybody because it's, it's, uh, it's just honest and, and people can differentiate that from fake <laughs> and so, uh, it, pretty quickly. And not only in this country, but it, it, all across the world, uh, I think they can differentiate. So, so as long as it's truthful and honest, and then I'll listen to it again and again and again and again. And, and, and I, if it's not, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker once, and then I'll just listen to something else. That's, that's the thing. We have so many options now. And the, the thing I think that's helped you know, bring more light to artists like yourself and a lot of the other ones that we feature is that they're not signed. They don't have a you know big label on them. Um, they don't have these contractual agreements and things that they have to do. And and they if they can get a social media following and if they can attract it, I mean I don't have to look any further than uh, well he's not doing music these days. But you know Granger Smith, that man is sure. huge. He can go anywhere in the world and get a huge <laughs> audience. He he isn't signed. He him he is himself right. his own. Well, was his own label, and he yep. is the epitome of artists who can do it. Uh, I think about Buddy Brown, if you've ever heard of him. Um, yep, he, he's a musician, and yet, while he's more known for now is political, you know, commentary, uh, you know, on YouTube and that. But he's developed his own following. He's got his own music and label, and thousands, if not millions, of fans. And so, do you feel like this switch in? how artists go about promoting themselves and doing their own, essentially them themselves, their own label and publishing company, if you will. Um, do you, do you feel like that that movement has kind of helped you? I think so. I think it's, uh, it, as, as long as people can hear your music, um, it's, it, it used to be there was only one way to get it out there. And of course, as you know, it, it, it had to be on the radio or you'd never hear it. Um, and then to get on the radio, you had to go through what I call the funnel, uh, you know, at least on the, on the, I don't even know what the great big networks of radio stations are under now, but then 
And so I always loved the independent stations. So because they would come and just play the song based on its merit. And uh, or not play it based on it fair. Either way, I was fine with that. <laughs> and, and these days, you're lucky if a station still even has a music director. A lot of times, it's your it's a production director and a general manager, and that's about it. Um, and a lot of these yeah, guys, and sometimes the, the programs, are, yeah, yeah. And so I tell you, it is it's hard um, for stations because instead of people showing up outside the door with the CD, they just want to give you. Nowadays, you got you know email, and I feel like I came from the last generation where people would still show up to the station with a disc. I and think I'm in that too. We're not that old, but we we must be old souls. <laughs> I mean, this is for me. This would have been you know uh, mid 2000s, so like 2008, 2009. We still had people sure. that would show up outside the station with CDs. Yeah. It was it was definitely becoming more email based, but even back then it was hard to email a whole song and services like Dropbox hadn't really taken off yet. Um and now we have so many. I can't even tell you how many logins I have to these different music portals where these publishers will put music out and then I get emails and I'll share some of the big ones that we have, you know, like um really well known ones like Generate Promotions, um CDX Nashville. Um, those are the big, big ones that we get tons of contacts. Um, and that's how the music industry kind of works is radio is the ones who discover it because that's what we get in emails. And then we, we talk, sure. we talk to other stations, um, and we kind of share it more openly, but then like once I'm, I don't know if this is just me and my station, but once a month, producer Raven and I will go down and we throughout the, the month, I'll take the one the songs that i heard and i do it once a month because i'll tell you because if i'm going to play it on the station i need to like it and if i'm in a bad mood like kind of tonight would be a terrible night for me to listen to music um but, but <laughs> it might be the perfect thing for you to do <laughs> it depends on the song if it hits me right but that's, that's the thing, true like, when yeah you're, when you're doing this it, what's so hard and a lot of stations still rely on like not nielsen ratings but you know they they, they have these like not books anymore what is it? I'm trying to think. But they have these like these, these song measurements of how well a song sure. is doing and performing and how many points it's got. And yeah. artists like you, it's so hard to break into that because if you're a traditional station, that's all you've known. If you're an old sure. music guy, that's what you know. But it's stations like us, internet stations and, and like, we can be a little bit more selective. But I got to admit, it's hard to listen to your song, compare it to another really good song. And I've only got room for one of them in my rotation because I have to play the really big top 10 stuff too because that's what people are really listening to. Um, because just sure. like you, radio is a, technically a business, right? So I got to have yep. ad revenue. I need In order for me to have ad revenue, I have to have listeners. So... Um, when I have to pick between your song and someone else's song, sometimes it really just comes down to, in my experience, what's going to sound the best. And I could be totally wrong. And oftentimes I am. And, you know, I have to adjust and, and do that. And I, I, we have listening voting now, which is something new. So if stuff starts oh, getting cool. downvoted a lot, then what am I supposed to do? I may personally like the song, but if the listeners sure. aren't liking it, we're seeing a trend. Uh, meaning like yeah. disconnects and that you know that's the way it works for you yeah. you're on stage and if someone really doesn't like the song i guess they just boo you but you know how do you as an artist <laughs> go about and I, I say all that long story around and then i've got a couple bits that we do naturally on our show here right after this question but um how do you as an artist then go and as you're writing a song and you're putting all this time and effort into writing it decide this is really good this one needs to get pushed to radio this one needs to make the album this one needs to get released and we're going to put you know thousands of dollars into promotion because i see other people i don't know about artists like yourself like you have to fork a lot of money to get these songs out there so how do you go and pick and choose which songs you're going to put out there see i don't um, because to me, they're, they're, they are like my babies. I, I tell you, some of them are ugly and some of them are beautiful, but that's in, in my eyes, in my opinion. So I, I got, uh, in, for this instance, it's uh, Crystal with Cabin Creek Promotions. I let her choose. I said, okay, pick something. <laughs> You've got a few songs to pick from. Pick something. She said, well, I think we should kick with, uh, start the promotion with Lucky I'm Not Dead. Mm -hmm. And then the next one we should follow up with is called Copperhead Watch. Uh, and I said, okay. And that was it. Because if you made me pick, I mean, I love them all. It's, it's like, you know, I came from a big family. My mom, there were 10 kids in her family. 
And in, in ours, there were five boys and two girls. So I've got, you know, six siblings. And uh, every one of us is different. And so can you imagine the parents saying, well, we'd like this one better than these six. <laughs> but they're, they're all good. So I could never make that judgment. Now, I do have my favorite songs, but that doesn't mean they're the right songs, you know. Uh, so when I'm writing a song, I'm just doing it because it, for my soul. I'm mm-hmm. doing it uh, not with any intention of, oh, this song will be, uh, you know, a number one hit someday because it's that good. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not that at all. It's just, uh, hey. This is this is what I've been led to write. I'm going to go write this thing, and, it, and if it won't leave me alone, I'm going to finish it. And, and, and that means it's probably going to be a pretty good song. And that's got to be the difference between the Nashville side and the Texas side, because like you said, on the Texas country music side, people write music to write music. And sure. on, um, and on the mainstream side, with these, you know, still RCA and Universal and big labels like that, and you know, th- these artists have to still put out because, you know, some of them still have these old contracts, you know, where they've got to make so right. much albums and put them out. And then these albums have to do so well and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think that that's probably the biggest challenge. And I see producer Raven trying to go and just see if we've got uh, any comments or anything across the streams here. And, uh, oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, just to see if anybody's got any questions. Doesn't look like it right now, but, uh, I think what we'll do is go ahead and jump over to our news section here. And uh, just remember, guys, if you guys do have any questions or anything you want to hear, let us know. All right. So a uh, couple of news stories here we want to get back to here. And we'll, we'll touch base with uh, Thomas back here in just a second here. But covering some of the stuff that was going to be on the show tonight. Uh, Luke Bryan turned out and had a country music sensation recently uh, with a lighthearted uh, anecdote about his photo shoot experience. So he had a new cover art for his latest single, Love You, Miss You, Mean It. Features a moody side of shot of Luke sitting in what appears to be arena seats. Surprisingly, this turned out to be one of the most straightforward photo shoots he's ever done. So here's the scoop on this one, guys. So Luke now has this thing where he wants this effortless setup. And he went on to perform at the Houston Rodeo. And he needed a picture for the single cover. So his social content manager and concert photographer happened to be backstage with a nice camera. They noticed the original seats from the Astrodome in the hallway and seized the opportunity for a quick shoot. Luke said he went on to do his makeup in about 10 minutes and then capture the perfect shot. No elaborate setups or hours of preparation, just a candid moment, worked beautifully for the cover art, and it does look good, y'all. Y'all should check it out. Uh, So now Luke has a new protocol. Uh, He humorously declared that moving forward, he wants every photo shoot to be as easy as the one uh, that he just did, and he's got a new template for it. 10-minute sessions. And he said, after all, there's nothing more frustrating than sacrificing a good fishing day for a lengthy photo shoot. So I got to agree with that. Why, why is there, and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and touch back with Thomas here before I go on to the next one. Thomas, why do you think there's so much effort into a, a photo shoot or a music video? And do you think that that makes a big impact on your career um, for what am- effectively amounts to a photo? Uh, how do you feel about stuff like that? I just want somebody to tell me if, whether I have a booger in my nose or not. That's about <laughs> it for me. So it's, it's just, it's, it's, you just, <laughs> you want to look as good as you can. You know, yeah, I always tell them on radio, make me look better than I do. So, <laughs> do- and you guys always deliver. Thank you, producer Raven. <laughs> yes. So we always try to do our best here. And do you have somebody who helps you do your album artwork and your posters and all of that? Yeah, I actually, uh, my daughter, uh, who's an art major has done, I guess the last four album covers, but they're just, uh, she doesn't do them with that in mind. She just does her art and I, I use it for the cover. What, uh, earlier ones, I was so vain. For some reason I had to be on the uh, cover, you know, with a, uh, some type of, of pensive look and a and a cowboy hat on, and uh, and I thought, man, this this art looks a lot better than me on the cover. I'll be on the inside or the back or somewhere, but <laughs> well, it's not. So hard I kind of got out of the way. Of I tell you what, that was uh, you've got some amazing <laughs> amazing stage photos that you know yeah. I, I was looking at them. Well, you take enough. <laughs> if they take enough of them, you can pick. 
They're good. They are really good. All right. Um, what was the next one, producer Raven? You got it lined up for me. A new article here. I was trying to. I thought you would have that one. Let's see. Did we only have the one? I thought we were going to do the. Um, oh. You told me not to. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> this is why I have a producer, by the way, because this I, is, my, yeah. that's my why it's called so the Bar ADHD Talk Happy Hour. It's it's it's. it's <laughs> And I, I had more, but you told me. You still have the concerts, though, right? Yes, I still have concerts. Let's cover concerts real quick, and then we'll keep going. Because I'm gonna. The other side of this interview that I wanted to do with Thomas here was uh, all about there. the stories. All right, so we're gonna get to some country concerts here, and then I'm gonna let Thomas tell you all about the concerts he's got coming up, including the big festival out in Lukenbach. So we'll transition to that here. But coming up on April 26, go check out Oliver Anthony. He's gonna be in Greensboro, North Carolina. On the 26th, Billy Currington and Kit Moore are going to be in Atlanta, Georgia. And on the 27th, Dylan Scott in Tucson, Arizona. And folks, I'm going to tell you our concerts are going to get a little bit more because guess what? We're in the country music festival season. And uh, it's going to be that way most of the summer. So get on board because we've got a lot of shows to tell you guys about. Now, Thomas, you've got this festival. And we alluded to it, I think, earlier. And you've been doing it for, I think, it's 13 years now, right? Uh, out in Lukenbach? Well, this is, yeah, this will be the 17th year. Oh, 17th, wow. What's now, now, and I'm only I'm only 25 too, so it's amazing. I, uh, <laughs> you and me both, I, brother. That's right. It's, <laughs> okay, maybe maybe 45, but it's oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, does, it doesn't seem like 17 years ago, you know. And uh, I can just go through the names of people that uh, that are no longer on this earth that have played it, like Guy Clark and Hal Ketchum, mm-hmm. and and uh, it's just and Jerry Jeff Walker. It's just. Uh, uh, it's just good music for good people. Uh, if you know anything about looking box, yes. the magic is still there. The, uh, uh, it's, you know, from the song, you know, Waylon and Willie and the boys. Well, I, I didn't, I wrote a song called the boys from looking box. When I figured out who they were, they're the women and men that have been inspired by that independent music we talked about, which we call it Texas or red dirt music. And, uh, and I think it began there back when Jerry Jeff, uh, cut the Viva Terlingua album live from looking back from that dance hall. So when you're, when you're in that dance hall or on those grounds, there's still hallowed grounds and you still feel like it's, it's just all about the music because the population is three. There's three people who live in looking back and that's it. The rest is the dance hall, you know, the streets, the, the bar, you know, the a gift shop, a post office, you know, there's nothing to it and a little loop that goes around. Mm-hmm. So, so music is nine to midnight, and then we sit around uh, campfires or plug-in campfires, depending on the burn bands, and just pick all night. So, you know, I'll look around at five o'clock in the morning, and uh, here's a guy named Roger Crager sitting there, you know, picking a new song. And and, uh, and he he's uh I mean he's not a no name either. I mean Roger Krieger. No, Come I know. All right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't. I couldn't believe it. You know, so so yeah, he's headline. But folks like you know Max Stalling and Heather, uh, they're just I, this year. Jamie Richards. I mean, Jamie Richards got mm-hmm. number one hits like I don't know ten or eleven on on the on the regional radio charts, and just they're just good good people. David Lee, I know you know him. Yep. Just from the songs that he's written, you know, it just but he can actually sing as good as anybody and, and accompany himself well. So he's, I mean, it just. They're they're here this year. So, uh, and then you were talking about humorists. You know, uh, Chad Prather is is going to be here, and he teams up with Steve Helms, who's a great artist, uh, mm-hmm. and Ben McPherson on fiddle. You know, world class fiddle player, and uh, so they'll be playing along with. Oh, I mean, it, it's a crazy lineup. So there's like 15 acts, noon to midnight, Friday May 3rd through Saturday May 4th. And that is just a great, if you guys can get out to there, go check this concert out. I mean, it's going to be unlike anything you've ever seen. Um, that, I wish I could get out to Luke and Bach. Hey, producer Raven, you think that might happen? <laughs> it's not far. It's only, what, about a thousand miles for you guys. Come oh, on. Oh, yeah. We were down in Austin last year. Were you? Yeah, we, uh, we couldn't get to see anybody local. It just happened to be the weird weekend that we were there. It was 111. And nobody Ouch. was performing, practically. Except, yeah, I don't blame him. <laughs> except for one artist. We did go see Clint Black. I was going to say, that was not true. We saw Clint Black. 
So oh, I love Clint Black. Yeah. He's, he's got it. I'll tell you, in his older age, it's getting harder for him to hit those high notes, but he's still got it otherwise. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's, I, uh, I first saw him, uh, and I had to, uh, had to pull over on the side of the road because the young girl that I took to go see Clint Black, but, you know, said she wanted, this was in Florida. She said, I want to see him. And, and she said, who's this guy opening for him? And it was Merle Haggard. <laughs> uh, so I said, "Let me explain to you who Merle Hager is." <laughs> that seems like it's in reverse. Hey, I, I don't know why. I know <laughs> it was, but Clint was hot, and it, it was uh, yeah, maybe fifteen, twenty years ago, and whenever he was, uh, yeah, nineties, really hot, and that's yeah. and that's the way it was. <laughs> it was good. Uh, is is good. there an, is there an uh, a songwriter or an artist that you've gotten to write with that? you can tell a story about that just kind of sticks with you through the years and about a song or how a song became to be between you and a writer or another artist. Yeah. The, uh, um, do you remember Chris wall? Mm -hmm. Chris wall had, uh, of course the big money hit there. He's, he said the songs are like kids and, uh, you know, you send them out there and some of them get job and they come back and they bring money back home. And other ones just drift off and, and do nothing for you. He said, but this one song came back, and it was Trashy Women. You know, I like my women just a little on the trashy yeah, side. Yeah, Confederate Railroad and all that. That's it. Yep. <laughs> but it was picked up and recorded uh, by maybe 12 different people. It, yeah, uh, but it did. Confederate Railroad. Yeah, so he, he kept getting his royalties for that song. And then I feel like Hank Williams tonight. So, so Chris and I... And Hal Ketchum. We this was after a festival, and uh, uh, nobody wanted to go home, so they all got on the bus with me, and we went to Lake Buchanan, which is maybe an hour and a half north of Lukenbuck, and we sat, I guess, for a week, and we wrote songs. Wow! And we drank, and we wrote songs, and we laughed. <laughs> you got to have the beer. <laughs> and, with we, it. <laughs> and we told stories. <laughs> Because thinking, it was just the three of us, uh, we could say anything. <laughs> Hell catch him! That small town Saturday night. Just want to touch back on him real quick. I we yes. play that song still, and it's oh, it's a great song. It's so there's so many artists, and then I can jump back over to Chris Wall, uh, of course, you know, Cowboy Nation, and yep. Let's see, what's another good one he did? Honky Tonk Heart. Yeah, he's strong. Yep. Um, oh God, yeah. Yeah, yeah they're, those guys are good. <laughs> and the fact that you got to write with them and, and pick with them, that's, that's just got to be a good experience. Uh, is, there a, I couldn't believe it. is there a crazier story or, or a, just an uh, odd or, or, I don't know, let's, let's go with humorous. Is there a good humorous story you can share about being on the road with any of these guys? And, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's got to be yeah. something in that 27 years. Well, sometimes uh, this this one's kind of funny. Uh, I don't know if I should protect the uh, the name of, of one of the people that we were just talking about, but yeah, <laughs> but when it was but it was his turn to come on. He he was coming on later than me, and he was overserved. And so I thought, well, this is going to be one of those one of those classic nights that you don't you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. <laughs> coming on so it's funny when guys, yeah. a lot of artists they get uh over served and had a few too many they go on and they still sound amazing i i do oh, yeah it's it's got to be a switch with those guys because they There's get no off stage question. and they can't even walk right but on stage you'd never know yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's what how how you should do that to the band he just you know mess with them and say drunk i'm so drunk you know before he got to play and then he <laughs> Just flawlessly do everything, but he just scared the crap out of the band members. Like, oh God, what's he gonna do? And he never, never missed a note, never went flat or sharp, never did anything. With it. So the other one that I'm talking about, we had to go make sure he was ready because now he's running late. And so the 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 band helped him get get the outfit on, including pulling his boots on. And walked him out there and got him in front of the mic, and, and he was fine, but he would turn around, you know, when there was a lead and just holler to the side, and he'd holler, socks, socks, 
<laughs> I guess they had put his his boots on, but his socks were stuffed down in his boots. And so he was having to stand in cowboy boots that were stuffed with socks. And so that was the only clue they had. <laughs> but he played his set fine. <laughs> but yeah, but it does get a little bit crazy. <laughs> I imagine as you get older, you know, you, you stop as doing as much of the drinking and partying after a show and you just, that's you just what they sorted, tell me. Yeah. You just sort of, that's what they tell me. <laughs> I think you gotta, I think everybody that, that I'm talking about plays all the way up to the moment of their death. I got to see Merle on his second to last show. And, uh, uh, my wife is like yours. I mean, I producer Courtney, I call her cause she has an ear for music and she wants to make sure that every heartfelt word from the artist can be heard. And, and not drowned out and not kept underneath, uh, you know, a, a pesky ride from the uh, electric guitar or something, you know, uh, on a heartfelt lyric. So, she, so she's on top of that. So she would ask the, she went to the soundboard and asked the guys if they could turn Merle's vocals up or, or pull down the, you know, the rest of the band so we could hear him better. And the guy looked at her and said, I'm with you. I know what you're talking about. Uh, thank you, but no. You don't want to hear Merle any louder. This this is as good as he's going to get tonight because he was at the at the at the end of the ride and we didn't know it, you know. Yeah. So, but that was his second to last gig. His last gig is when Toby Keith stepped in and helped out. And, mm, yeah. Uh, God so, rest his soul. Toby too. Keith's gone. Yeah. What's the deal? I keep asking God, go fishing somewhere else if you if you don't mind. Pick another industry for just a little while and go fishing there. Sometimes uh, this pond is getting some some great talent sucked out of it. <laughs> it is, and a lot of the greats, you know, you and I are getting to that probably a point where it, a lot of the greats that we love seeing. Uh, actually, I'm supposed to go see George Strait in May up in Ames, Iowa, and uh, he's my number one. But let me tell you, wow. here's here's the thing: when I go to a concert, I have to be down in front because being legally blind, I I wouldn't be able to see, and it's no good for me to go to a concert and just hear it. When I could hear it right. at home, right? I want to see sure. the performance. I want to see the show. Um, yeah. So, given that George Strait is my number one, I already seen Garth Brooks uh, a few years back, but uh, George Strait's my number one artist that I, I got to see before I die. And we happen to have tenth row back seats right in front of the stage. And remember, George Strait does stadium tours. Right. So. I've got a double mortgage payment ticket to go see George Strait, and that's something that I'm trying to swallow <laughs> down still. It well, was uh, just you over could two track grand. it off the bucket list. Yeah, it, <laughs> it is, and I'm thinking to myself, because I had to get these tickets early. I, I managed to yeah. get uh, pre-sale tickets, and no, I cannot tell anybody how I got them because I didn't do it the way that you normally do it. I had a little inside help. Uh, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about it, but I got, I got it right. early. And uh, I could sell those tickets for a lot more money if I wanted to. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, a lot more. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> two grand just to the base tickets. And I'm thinking to myself, this better be worth it. Because that's like two mortgage payments, you know? Yeah. And I'm thinking yep. now as I've sat with these tickets since September now when it was announced. And, you know, the concert's not till May. And I'm thinking to myself, is this going to be worth it? Like, is, am I going to go to this thing, 10th throw back? Of course, I'll be able to see. The stage is going to be above my head, right? So I'm going to be, sure. like, my neck cocked up, you know, looking at him. Yeah. And George Street, he, I've, seen, I've seen videos of him live. I haven't seen him in person yet. He doesn't move from what I've seen. No. He, he, no, he's, he's not going to dance. <laughs> he's not Garth Brooks and going to be running this way and that way. with the head. That's right. At, at church, we even call it the Garth Brooks mic. It's a head-worn mic. You know, it goes in front of your mouth. He's yeah. he's not going to be doing that. He's going to be standing right there, and and and, and George has got a bit of a belly on him, so that's what the guitar is for to cover the belly up. That's right. That's a prop <laughs> that hides your belly. That's, that's let me, what let I me carry ask it, you yeah. this. You know, I I don't know if you have a ton of you know paid shows that you do where you sell tickets and all that to get in. There's probably a cover charge for a lot of the shows you do. But what do you what do you think about you know ticket sales and things like that? When is is there is there something that you can share about ticket prices and how you as the performer either benefit or don't benefit from a base price of a ticket, you know, being higher than what it was like used to go to a, a country show 
10, 20 bucks gets you in the door. Now you're barely getting into a show for 60 or 70. Like, what, what are your thoughts yeah. on that? Well, I, here, here's mine, and I tell them it, it shows. I will, I think music is too important to limit it only to the people that can afford it. Because it might be the people, at least my music, it might be the people that can least afford it that need it the most. Mm. And so I learned that at an early age. I, I snuck into a place, and they caught me. And, uh, and the guy said, well, you're that skinny kid that I've seen here around the picker circle, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I'm going to let you in. But he told me that. And he said, as long as you don't forget that when you get to be a big shot. And I never have. Mm. I've always thought, uh, uh, come as you are. We'll help you if you need help. And there, there'll be enough people here that will help you. It, you know, Because we're all really woven in this thing together called life on this earth. And, uh, and we're here to help each other. So, but I, I'll tell you what, so I try to do, and I learned this from, you know, a long time ago. It was, it was at a Merle show. I got to open for Merle Haggard at Gillespie County Fairgrounds and he would not let them jack the prices up. He said, no, I want working man prices. Yep. He said, you're not going to do that. I want working man prices. And from my perspective, I would rather, I'd rather play to a, to a house of people that came for the music, whether they could afford it or not, then I would play to a house of people that, that are only the ones that could afford it. And sometimes so, that is really people's only means, you know, with inflation these days, there are people like if they do any entertainment, it's you got to be free or next to free. And yeah, because otherwise they just can't afford it. I did want to pull out a quote from you. You led right into it. Um, this came, I found this on your website. It's on your bio page. And you said, quote, I'm here to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And, and, and flick the comfortable to bring music and laughter to the people who need it the most. I got a long way to go. End quote. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> How long ago did you write that? And um, does it still mean the same thing today as it did then? It means more because it's solid. You know, once you find out uh, why God put you on this earth, then you're screwed. You got to go do it. You know, you can stand there and shake your, your fist at God and say, no, not this. I want to be a doctor. You know, <laughs> well, no, you're going to do this on this trip around the sun. Let's just see what you can do. And uh, so I figured, well, I better be the best I can then because, uh, you know, that's what I'm, that's why I'm here. And so it's actually more every year. Now, when did I finally realize that? Probably on the third or fourth album. Uh, and I wrote a song called Who I Am. And you, you can Google it, Thomas Michael Riley, Who I Am. And it'll pop up probably on YouTube or somewhere. But there you go. And in that, I wrote down the lines. Of, uh, these songs that I've written, uh, these stories I'm told, bring laughter and music to the people that need it the most. You know, my heart in heaven, feet on the ground. Any place I ain't been yet, that's where I'm bound. So uh, those are lyrics in the song that are just from my heart. And that's the way I live my life. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah, and look where it brought us tonight. <laughs> we just, you and you and Raven and me and, yeah. and great folks out in the radio land, and, and here we are. And that wouldn't happen, you know, if if we weren't trying to do this. It's the same thing you're doing. <laughs> that's it. It's all about that, and that's why I relaunched Mix Country 106 in 2022. Is I didn't. I was up in Iowa. We don't have any radio stations that play Texas style music, and I call it Texas style because mm -hmm. it's. It sounds like good country music. You don't hear this sound, and it's, it, you'll know it when you know it. But I, sure. I, I mean, I love classic music and, and like good 90s country. That's kind of the bread and butter that I was raised on. Um, but nothing sounds like that anymore. And everything sounds yeah. pop. It's got a big, fat bass beat to it. And that's great for some things, but it don't sound like country music to me. And no, <laughs> uh, and I'm a I'm a boy. I'm originally from Oklahoma. I was born there, and then raised my half li my life down in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, my mother had family up in Iowa, so when my folks split, uh, we moved up to Iowa and lost my accent some years ago. But you get me mad enough, it'll come out. <laughs> but I'm I'm an old country boy at heart. My granddad uh, had me every weekend out on his cattle farm, and from age six to twelve until we moved. Every weekend, I'd be out there in the spring and summer uh, helping him and doing cattle work. And so, and how is that punishment, Odie? Oh, Raven wants me to talk about uh, 
See, I always had eyesight <laughs> issues. It wasn't like I could never, like, I had a point in my life where my eyesight was great. It was just better with that as a kid. Yeah. Um, but granddad yeah. would let me drive his tractor, and I would use it, and I'd, you know, uh, I, I couldn't say I could handle a rope well as a kid, but I knew enough to, to move cattle, all right? I knew how to use I knew what I was doing. Um, and I, but I would, I would use just to use the tractor because he didn't have any horses. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been better because then I could have really called myself a cowboy. But there you go. Uh, but anyway, I learned that don't run over the cow pies with Granddaddy's tractor. Otherwise, he'll hand you a nice little pick and make you pick all that crap off the tire. He will. Oh man! Uh, uh, yeah. Can't tell you that afternoon. Him getting so mad at me. I don't think I ever seen him mad. At He's like, I told you. To watch out for the cow pies, and I think you done ran over every single one of those in that pasture back there. Wow. Sorry, Granddad. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> well, you'd have to be going around a lot because those cows poop a lot. You know, that's they, what... they do. I mean, it was almost inevitable in my mind, but I got them, got them fenced in. I did what he asked me to do. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but that is you know, crazy. So I learned I learned that. And and when I think about country music and I think about the stories just from that story, you know? Um sure. it, it it just has more meaning. And when country music this day these days just doesn't have that same meaning, at least the mainstream music. It it just it all has the same storyline kind of rhyme to it. And I want to hear good stories. I love storytelling songs. Sure. There's an insight. If you want to get featured on Mix Country 106, make me feel something when I listen to your song. Let me hear the story behind it, and that's probably going to work uh, as a feature. That's, that's just my taste in there. And that's why we did Mix Country 106 this way, because we wanted to feature artists like yourself. You know? You're well-known, but not well-known in the wider scope of you know the the world and i'm trying to bridge yeah. this gap between the traditional country music people the new age country music people and bridge that gap to let more music come out and i wouldn't say compete with the nashville sound but i would say get, do something that helps it complement and i feel like what we do as a radio station now our goal is to be more niche, niche if you will to be more unique, to give you music that you're not easily going to find on Spotify, YouTube, and all of that. I think that's what we do, and that's why people listen Very to us. Very cool. Um, we just got a few minutes here. Producer Raven, is there anything I am forgetting to do? Just a usual reminder before you say goodbye. Oh, yeah. Remember, everybody, uh, <laughs> it's okay to go have a few drinks out there. I'm sure Thomas and I are both going to have a few drinks after this, uh, but uh, don't have too many. And if you do, get a ride. And your butts better be in church tomorrow, all right? Drinking ain't the sin, being drunk is. So that's what we always say here. And uh, y'all, uh, just be good and careful. And I want to thank uh, our the other syndicate stations for airing the Bar Talk Happy Hour. Uh, they've all got their own copies, so their stations aren't affected. So if you're listening to them, they'll air at the regular scheduled times. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast that comes out, it'll be available here in just about two minutes here. You guys can hear that on your favorite podcast platforms. Make sure you download the mobile app and uh, get on that because remember you can upvote and downvote songs it's available for iOS and Android and uh, I think that's about it isn't that producer Raven did I forget anything no other than if you see us out in public make sure you ask us for one of our cards yeah I got one right here hold on she always makes me do this I don't feel so shameless <laughs> we got these cards here folks uh, make sure you ask them for us he's got a special QR code you can actually uh, when I see you you can even get my cell phone number it's right on there on there. I don't mind. And uh, that's one of the other benefits. You get an inside chat with me. Uh, I don't care. And uh, also, uh, on the back here, you guys can see our show lineup and rundown. And, yeah, that's pretty much about that. So make sure you ask us for one of the cards when you see us out in public. And uh, a funny, real quick story here, and I guess I'm not really under a time limit, am I? Because I'm not timing this with the show. This is part of the live stream. Yeah. I'm not used to this. But real quick, I did want to tell you a quick story. Um, we had the, one of the first times that somebody asked or recognized me in public because they don't recognize me until I talk, um, which obviously makes sense. But uh, it was uh, my lab technician who was taking the blood out of my arm because I go and uh, get lab work regularly. And she's like, I think I know you. And I'd never met her before. She was a new technician to, the, to that um, hospital, I guess. And she goes and she starts taking my blood. She's like, I think I know you. I'm like, yeah, where from? Did we go to school? 
So that's usually my first thought because I, I hadn't really got recognized in public before then. And she's like, no, you're the radio guy. You got that, uh, what's it? She called it Mix 106. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's me. That's Odie Coyote. And as soon as I said Odie Coyote, I'm so glad she had the needle out of my arm by then because her reaction had the big like eyes. that I'm like, oh, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I well, I'm going to start using that line. I know Odie Coyote and producer Raven. That's <laughs> <laughs> we're getting known. I, I, I've, it, it amazes me now. I must be getting known because I, I mean, like I said, I could be out in public, and I, it's happened more than once. Raven still works a day job. She does retail for Walmart, and people have recognized oh, her cool. in public when she's just working. Yeah. Um. Huh? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> That's my favorite place to shop. Uh, if I'm not in Walmart, I'm in Sam's. <laughs> I, I was going to say, that I, I know a lot of people hate on Walmart, but it's still, I mean, if, when you need something cheap, obviously support local businesses where you can. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Thomas, is there anything else you wanted to share with everybody tonight? Did I not get something important? Because I'm liable to forget something that we agreed that we we're going to talk about. So, you got anything else for no, you kidding? No, everything you do is important. Keep uh, keep folks listening, keep their eyes open, and uh, just uh, help lift them up. And you're doing all those things, and and uh, and turn them on to music. If you like uh, lyrics with music, uh, just Google Thomas Michael Riley, and, and uh, I bet you'll find some. <laughs> I bet you will too. Thomas Michael Riley dot com, and uh, you can go check out his calendar schedule. Uh, of course, the big Lukenbach uh, festival coming up here. And yeah, absolutely. So I think with that, we'll go ahead and wrap things up here. Thank you guys again so much for tuning in. I'm Odie Coyote and producer Raven, of course, Thomas Michael Riley. Thank you so much. And we will see you guys next week for the Bar Talk Happy Hour.